What's it like to lose your forearm to a tiger? As soon as my hand went through that cage, he immediately bit it. The rest of the damage, he just brought his claws up and just shredded from above my elbow. And then he just shredded it all the way down. Saf from the Netflix series Tiger King tells the tale, plus how two brown recluse bites has put a Nashville woman in and out of the hospital for 12 years. And it was almost like you, when you step on a stick out on a hike or something and you, and you get whapped, you know, and it didn't really hurt. But it was enough for me to look down and I could see the diamond pattern of the snake. And at that point, it occurred to me that I'd just been bitten by a rattlesnake. So I jumped up and I said, a man gets bitten by a northern Pacific rattlesnake and goes on a quest to understand the science behind his encounter. And we may not have to worry about tigers in New England, but what animals should we be on the lookout for? I'm Kyone Wolf. Find out next on Audacious, after the news. From Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford, this is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Today, you're going to hear from three people who had close encounters with wild animals and have the scars to prove it. You'll hear how and if any of these people felt defined by their experiences and what sense they've made out of their encounters. Plus, you'll hear from a wildlife expert about what animals you should be careful to keep away from here in New England. According to Netflix, about 64 million households watched Tiger King in the four weeks after its March 20th premiere. It was a seven-part series covering the industry of tiger breeding and tiger keeping. It focused mainly on the, shall we say, eccentric Joseph Allen Maldonado Passage, also known as Joe Exotic. He had over 200 tigers at his Greater Winniewood Exotic Animal Park in Winniewood, Oklahoma. One of the people in charge of taking care of those tigers for almost 10 years was Kelsey Saf Safari. Saf grew up in Hawaii, loving animals. I was the, the kid who brought things home, thinking that, you know, I was some kind of rescue center. <laughs> I was pretty likely to take your dog out of your yard as well. When he was a kid, he would rush to the tiger enclosure at the zoo. But for some reason, the tiger never showed itself. So since then, he's been drawn to what he felt was the mysterious nature of tigers. So I asked him what led him to Joe Exotic Zoo. Oh, man. In... 2010, I was transitioning out of the army. So I did a Google search. I was in Lawton, Oklahoma. How can I interact with a tiger? How can I get my hands on a tiger? And Joe Exotic Zoo, the GW Zoo, was about an hour and a half away from me. And that was just my life. As soon as I set foot on that park in 2010, I did not leave until 2018. He took me, he walked me out to park, and he walked up to the first tiger cage we saw, which was immediate. It was like 10 feet out the door, you know. And the second you're up against that cage with this beautiful 500-pound animal, just like if you can imagine the most empowering moment in your life, whether it was when you drove the car for the first time, you know, whether it was walking across your graduation stage or anything, anything that puts you in a place where you are so, so completely vulnerable, but you took it on like a champ. I mean, I was in the military and I haven't had empowering moments like that in the military. Like the moment, like the feeling I had when I first had zero, nothing else in between me and this apex predator, just walking them or being in their presence felt like I was completely untouchable. <laughs> so yeah, I mean it's it's incredible. Yeah, that's almost like that strength is contagious or something, you know. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And they're beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, and so incredibly large that every single thing of theirs is pretty monumental, you know, every roar, every sound they make, every move they make. I mean, you feel it in your bones when they're walking around you. It's incredible. And I loved every second of it. So let's go to the day that was the beginning of the story of how you lost your arm. What happened that day? October 5th, 2013. It was a Saturday. It was a typical tour Saturday, which for us on park uh, meant busy. We were going to be very busy. Hundreds of people come through the park on Saturdays and Sundays for our interactive tours. But on top of that, we still have to feed clean and, and water every animal in the park. We still have chores, you know, and I was coming up to my 1130 tour. I was complacent and I wasn't focused. So basically I was just cleaning cages. You move the tigers, you move the animals from one from their main enclosure to a separate enclosure 
so that you can work safely and properly. And then when you're done, you lock up your cages and then you move all the animals back into their main enclosures. And I was simply moving that cat back into his main enclosure. We have every tool in the book to work with. All I did was instead of using a, a lever, a tool that we have to open and close the doors, I used my hand. I, I stuck my hand in the cage that he was standing in in order to pull that door so that he could come into the cage that I was in his main enclosure. And yeah, he, as soon as my hand went through that cage, he immediately bit it. The second he grabbed onto my hand with his mouth, he did not let go from that moment. The rest of the damage, he just brought his claws up and just shredded from above my elbow. And then he just shredded it all the way down, just all claw damage. And you got to remember their claws are about an inch and a half, completely sharp, completely built to shred through uh, their prey's skin, their prey's fur, their prey's anything. It lasted about 15 seconds and, and, and that's pushing it. You know, that's the most that it lasted. It happened so quick. I mean, literally, it felt like I went from one second standing at that cage to the next, next second, my arm shredded. I mean, it was so fast. What happened next? Man, damage control. <laughs> damage control. Secure the cages, secure the employees, secure the park. Because at this point, it was, a, it was a pretty big deal. You know, um, from above my elbow down to my wrist was completely shredded. I don't think I had a, an ounce of skin left to show anybody. Did you see it? Like, were you looking at it? Because I imagine some people when they're you're going through stuff like this, they don't want to see the damage, but <laughs> you you saw, you I did. looked at right. your arm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. What was yeah. that like? I mean, you've only known your arm to be all together your whole life, right? What was it like seeing your right. arm in that condition? Yeah, uh, surreal. I mean, looking at it and seeing the amount of damage just kind of brought this this brand new sense of like reality. But it's incredible the kind of the the lucky that I got. And I only obviously knew this after the fact. The doctor said that because it was his claw and he did it in almost a shredding motion that it closed up all my arteries for me. So instead of slicing it open and letting me bleed out, it almost shrinked it back. You know, when you pull something apart and it shrinks at the end, my arteries pulled back so much that I didn't bleed out as much as I would have. Um, I did bleed, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> it wasn't excessive. They took about two inches of my wrist and then my, my entire left hand. At first, they were able to save your hand and you were able to move it a bit. But then they said, well, you can either go through years of surgeries and keep your hand maybe to the degree to which we hope, or we can do this amputation at your, at your forearm. Was that an easy decision for you? At the time, it was almost immediate. And I think it was because I was specifically looking for one answer, and that was how quickly can I get back to park? So when he said, you know, it's going to take years of reconstructive surgery once we reattach it, and I can't give you the amount of capability or ability, mobility you have out of your actual hand, and that'll change throughout the years. I was like, <laughs> years? I'm not talking years. Like, I have other things on my mind. So amputated, you know, and he was like, okay. And I returned to work seven days, exactly seven days after my incident happened. So it happened on the 5th. My hand was amputated on the 7th. And I was back at park, on park, working with the animals on the 12th. So that's kind of my mentality. That's where my mindset was at, you know, just push forward, keep going, soldier on, because uh, there's bigger issues at hand here. So to speak. Yeah, so to speak. You take a step, take another step. So that's, that's kind of what I did, just drive forward. Yeah. What kind of feelings were going through you when you were back with those tigers who you loved so much and went through uh, like a legit e scary elated. experience with? Elated. <laughs> right, right. I was completely elated. The, that, that was the only thing I wanted to do. Everything that I was able to do before this incident happened, I could do it again by myself after the incident happened. And I did. So, yeah, so that was incredible for me. And I, I would not change a single thing. I think it's taught me more than I could have learned doing that job two-handed for the rest of my life, doing anything two-handed for the rest of my life. I feel Albert Einstein said adversity introduces a man to himself. And I, I'm happy that, that I got to experience that firsthand because I would have never been able to truly say, I can do that. No matter what life throws at me, I can handle it. And now I genuinely feel like I can. I, I feel like I was able to pull all these things from it that strengthened me, 
You know, I don't think for one second that this disabled me or made me weaker in any way, shape or form. I think it did the exact opposite. It gave me an opportunity to be stronger. You know, there's a lot of things that I'm able to do now because this struggle was thrown my way. You know, there's a lot of things that I know about myself now that I would have never known had this struggle not been thrown my way. So I'm completely humbled and blessed by that. And I just take it for what it is every day, still till today. And I run with it and just hope for the best, you know, <laughs> or deal with the deal with whatever comes my way. But it's been it's been awesome so far. So when some people go through attacks by animals and it's a big deal, it's in the news, they're sort of defined by it for better or worse, whether they're happy about that or not or something in between. You are defined too many people, not only by this injury, but also by Tiger King, the Netflix series. Do you feel more defined by the experience with the tiger, the experience as a subject in a documentary that was massive, or something else? I honestly feel like that depends on who you ask. My personal opinion, I'm obviously more defined by my actions on a day-to-day basis. For a very long time after my incident, before filming or the documentary, I was, you know, oh, this is the guy that got bit. You know, yeah, he was in the news or, you know, little back and forth banter. But for the people that knew me every day, to include all the people I worked with on park, I was just sad. You know, I was just uh, the guy who came back after he got bit. I don't think that I've ever really looked into how people can perceive me or, or, or conceive me. I think more than that, I just wanted them to know that I wasn't there for any other reason, but because I was living my dream. And I mean, I was, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do every second of the day. And as long as you're not trying to take that from me, we're good. <laughs> we're good. So it definitely depends on who you ask. The people who have known me Prior to Tiger King, they have their own experiences with me. I have a lot of people that I was in the military with that know nothing about, you know, my experience with tigers or even Joe on the park or anything like that. I have people who know me strictly as just, you know, the the family man who just stays home and raises kids now. You know, I mean, for a long time before the military, I was just uh, Sam's little brother or Jesse's older brother. You know, these are just these beautiful moments in my life that literally built who I am today um, that could be defined in so many different ways. I think that it just genuinely depends on who you ask. (laughs) Have there been ways that you have sort of commemorated? I mean, losing your hand is, is a hell of a way to commemorate having lost your hand. I mean, you don't need any more than that. (laughs) I think aside from the tattoo that I placed and I I know it's pretty difficult to see, but I basically just got a, a, a tiger claw on the same arm to kind of commemorate that, you know, it was, it was a moment where man met beast. I stood zero chance. So if I didn't realize how powerful they were and how outpowered I was by them, overpowered I was by them, in that moment, it all came to life. It was very real. So more so than the tattoo, I I don't know if I did anything really tangible, you know, it's, it's an intangible feeling. I mean, feelings, you know, it's an intangible thing. It's, it's a moment, it's an experience in my life that I can only talk about and no one will ever actually know. No one will ever actually be able to feel those emotions and pull from that moment, um, except me and the tiger. So the tattoo was something that I wanted to do to kind of signify the unity of what happens when man meets beast, you know, which is what I did for a living. It's what I did. That was my contribution to that. There was nothing I could do to this tiger. You know, all I could do was continue to interact with it so that it knows, Hey man, didn't change anything here. You know, still here. I understand that the tiger was not put down. The tiger was just sort of moved because it was your, your fault. It was absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it feels like a weird, a strange word to use, but when you saw that tiger again, did you communicate? Did you like have a message for it? And if if not, if you could talk to that tiger again after everything you've been through, what would you want to communicate to that tiger? I think for me personally, my biggest message for the cat itself was was my showing up again, was my continuing our routine as far as he knew as best I could. Animals don't understand words. You know, they don't understand when you're like, sorry, it took me a week, but I had to do this. You know, 
they only understand actions. You know, they understand that if you feed them, if you water them, and you never mess with them, then you're not a threat and you're okay to be there until you screw that up. I don't know. I, I think with my animals, I've always communicated more through actions. Here I am and uh, I'm okay with this if you're okay with this, you know, and, and that's really how my relationships with them went. And I think that's what I love the most about it. You know, man, I could sit here and talk all day, but with animals, I don't think I've said a word. You know, it was more of a heart to heart kind of thing. I love that. So that was the only message I had for it. Sort of like with people too. Uh, words, words are useful. Right. I, I'm appreciative that you're using words with me right, right. now because that's my for job. Sure. But <laughs> but being able to show with your actions, I mean, that's that is everything, and that's what you did with these cats. That's what I did. Oh, yeah, of, that was like I said, that was my biggest message. Well, the, I've asked everything that I wanted to ask. Is there anything that I left out that you want to make sure you say in in the context of of what you've been through? For one, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on it. Um, I think it's important for people to kind of hear other people's experiences because one of the biggest struggles that you would struggle with, um, with injuries is, man, how am I going to get through this? You know, not knowing that there's literally millions of people who have gone through the exact same thing. So yeah, that's, that's one thing that I absolutely love doing is sharing my story so that maybe one day, someday one person can benefit from it. You know, one other person, a couple of other people just, just know that man, your body is so much stronger than your mind would give it credit for. If you keep your mind where your body is, your body will always have your back no matter what. That was Kelsey Saffrey. He now lives with his partner and three kids in California. They don't have any house cats, but they do have hamsters. Next. The knee just kept turning darker and darker, and that's when they decided to do, like, the first surgery. Hear how a woman who got bitten by a brown recluse spider not once, but twice, still struggles to make sense of it all. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Stay with me. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Today we're hearing stories from people who've survived injuries from wild animals. Jane Heffron is a 39-year-old registered nurse in Nashville, Tennessee, and 12 years ago she was heading in a different direction with her career. She'd just graduated from Vanderbilt Law School, and she was studying for the bar. When... I noticed a small mark on my knee. It just looked like an insect bite. No big deal. I was, like I said, when you're studying for the bar exam, it pretty much consumes your life for those months. So I ignored it. Wait, did it itch at all? Was it, or was it just inflamed? What, what was it like? It was inflamed and then it started getting like really painful. So then it started swelling. At the time I was actually like seriously phobic of doctors of the medical field. So when you see this little bite on your knee that's getting inflamed and more painful, you're really grappling with the decision to seek help. Definitely. Um, But then I started, you know, it started running low grade fever. Um, Now I had been doing some physical therapy for another injury. And when I got there, he looked at my knee and he was like, I'm not treating you. We're not doing anything. You're going to the emergency room. And he like literally like dragged me to the emergency room and just deposited me there. Like I thought he was going to stay at least. (laughs) What did you think this bite was at this time? Honestly, at this point, I did not even think about bite whatsoever. I remember when we were trying to figure out I had been in the parking lot of my apartment complex, killing time and trying to de-stress by playing some street hockey. So I remember like the ball had gone under a car and I had knelt down and there was some glass and I'm thinking, well, maybe I knelt on glass and it got infected. So really a bite wasn't even mentioned at that point until people came in and then they started looking at it and they're like, well, what did you get bit by? I I have no idea. Um, So they initially 
put an IV in and they gave me vancomycin, which turns out I had an anaphylactic allergy to. Which how could you possibly anticipate what happened? Exactly, because I had never had anything, like no IV antibiotics, nothing. They ended up, I think I was there for three days initially. They kept asking if it was bite. They did an MRI. They did some tests, um, gave me some antibiotics and sent me home. And like, I know I woke up one morning and just felt like absolutely, I mean, the knee just kept turning darker and darker. And then I woke up one morning and had like 103 or 104 degree fever. So that's when um, they decided to do like the first surgery. And what was the surgery supposed to accomplish? Everything that was red or dark or anything, you know, they took out, removed all that skin, washed it out, and then they put a wound back on it with the goal of then having me get a skin graft two or three weeks down the line. And you still at this point don't know what happened to yourself? When they did the surgery, they did send the stuff to pathology. And then that's when they came back and they're like, it's a brown recluse bite. Now I'm from Michigan. I had never heard of a brown recluse. They had asked me, you know, originally when I came in, if it was a brown recluse bite. And I was like, I, I don't even know what that is. Like, I could not tell you. Like, But in Tennessee, they sure are there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've learned a lot about them now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you have been to the hospital. You've gotten the surgery. They confirmed it was brown recluse. They were hoping that a skin graft would work. Did it? No, you know, and there's nothing quite like having them like shave off skin from your thigh and staple it onto your knee. And then you go to the doctor and they like take off the stuff and they're just like, oh, it didn't take. And they literally just like peel it off and throw it in the trash. (laughs) I know it would have been nice to have some sort of a ceremony or, you know, shoot it out of a cannon. I know they tried at least one more skin graft that summer. That one didn't take either. And maybe like a third one in the fall, um, but none of them are taking and they're, you know, they're trying to figure out why. Now, of course, they were trying to graft on my knee. So that's not exactly the best place. <laughs> I mean, they had me a knee immobilizer, but eventually a spot appeared on my other leg, on my shin. I clearly remember I was in the clinic, you know, they were looking at my knee and they said, well, what's that? And there's like, clearly it looked like a bug bite, like a tiny bug bite on my right shin. At this point, are you thinking, I've just got another brown recluse bite? Or were you thinking, oh, it's just a bug, it's probably just a bug bite, an innocent bug bite? At the, when I was in the clinic, I was still, you know, thinking, okay, well, maybe it's just a mosquito bite. Maybe it's just, but like, literally by the time I got home within hours, it had already like swollen up. Like it was a big, huge bump then. And it's like, I knew that that wasn't good. Um, what were you thinking? Like what, the, after everything you've been through, are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'm like, is this a joke or like, where are these spiders? Like, if the, you know, what is going on now in reality, they're not even sure. Or initially they thought that definitely was a second bite, but um, a dermatologist got involved and I clearly remember at first I wanted nothing to do with her. I was like, I don't want to see her. Like, this is a bite, like get her out of the room. Like, but she kept saying, Oh, I think it's this autoimmune. I think it's this, uh, blah, blah, blah. And they had taken to explain why your skin grafts weren't taking. Right. Finally, she's like, you know, if it's what I think it is, you have to biopsy an active area. You can't just like, you have to choose like the right area of the wound to biopsy. So please let me come in. Like we'll do another surgery and let me be in there and I will biopsy. After that, it did confirm that I had pyoderma gangrenosum, which is a very lovely name. Uh, Cause everybody says you have gangrene, gangrene. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which no, I do not have gangrene. <laughs> so what's the layman's terms of what that means? So basically it's a white blood cell deficiency. So when there's trauma to my skin, like from an insect bite or even like from surgery, from a bump, my neutrophils go crazy and think that there's an infection. So basically like your neutrophils just multiply out of control and they eat away and ulcerate like your own skin, like basically it's eating away your own body. Now, is this something that you probably had your whole life? Yeah, that was triggered by the bite. Now, my dermatologist who I have become friends with, and she is like the one doctor that I have continued to see through this whole thing, which is, you know, ironic since, like I said, I didn't want anything to do with her initially. And now, 
we're, she's the only one and we still talk by email and phone and communicate because she happens to be actually an authority on Pieter McGee, <laughs> which is one of the few doctors in the country who actually knows anything about it. So I guess I lucked out in that sense. <laughs> For sure. So, so you get bit by the spider, you have this terrible reaction made worse by this autoimmune disease, and then they notice a second bite on your other leg. And holy crap, then what? What did they make of it? At that point, there's no, it's an autoimmune thing. So nobody really knows. Well, we don't really know very much about autoimmune. That's what everybody says. We don't really, we don't really know. So it's kind of just like they throw the kitchen sink at you as far as treatment. And in the meantime, everything's getting worse. The The wound on the right leg ended up getting way worse. Um, That's the original bite? No, the other one. Oh. Uh, the original one, I think because it was on the side of my knee, there's just not that much flesh there. You know, it, it literally was almost on bone to begin with. There's not that much there. But the one on my shin, at one point, I had bone and tendon exposed. Um, and they didn't even know if I was going to keep my leg because I had so many other issues that happened. I mean, my health just deteriorated. I went from like a healthy athlete to like staying in the hospital for two or three months at a time. If you could talk to the spider that bit you or the spiders that bit you and like say something to them, I know it wasn't all their fault, but what would you say to those spiders? I mean, I wouldn't say anything. I just squash it and kill it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to give it time to chat, but looking at the big picture in all honesty, I mean, I literally, and I tell this to people all the time, I've had two completely different lives. There was me from age zero to 27. And then there's me from 27 to 39. Honestly, they're two completely different lives. And even my mom sometimes still will be like, I just want the old Jane back, like, blah, blah, blah. What I do now and the life I have and the career I have is honestly something I like better. I like my job. I like what I do. And that never would have happened. Like I said, I was phobic of doctors. I was phobic of anything in the healthcare field. Now, the unfortunate part is, like I said, I've led two different lives. So I used to be so active. I didn't want to ever stay home. I always wanted to be doing something constantly. Um, you know, I ran every single day. I was running 10 to 15 miles a day in law school in the mornings every day. Um, you know, I played soccer in college. I thought I'd be playing soccer. Like, you know, all of that changed. Now I'm this sickly looking person that has, and I honestly have no energy. And that's the sad, I mean, I have basically zero social life. Not helped by COVID. Yeah. When you see spiders now. <laughs> Tell me what goes through your head. Uh, well, now the problem with brown recluse is apparently if there's one, there's probably like 500 of them. I just rather be blissfully ignorant as to whether or not they're crawling around. I have not seen any in the place I live, but you know, it's Tennessee and there's a million little creepy crawly things, especially in the summer when it's so hot and humid and yeah. Do you feel like this whole experience has defined you in some way? And if so, how do you feel about that? I am defined now as like a patient or, you know, by the sickness. And it's hard because the people I know now didn't know me before. And so this is the only me they see. And I think it's very hard for them to ever even think that I could have been athletic or healthy or anything. I mean, I am defined now by my sickness and being a patient in that regard. But in another regard, it's, it's totally different. Because if you have somebody, you know, if you have somebody who has a, a generalized sickness, like, okay, I have breast cancer, well, everything is, you know, everybody supports that. When you have something that's like completely bizarre, it's hard, I think, for people to understand that, especially when you look at me, I go to work and all of my scars, everything is covered up by my scrubs. You can't tell. And I think it's interesting sometimes when I tell people and they're like, you know, you've got two knee replacements and two shoulder, like what, huh? Like you don't look. And so that's hard when you don't have a visible 
disease, you know, I've had surgeries and parked in handicap before and I get out and you get those stares of people like that. I'm like cheating the system or something. I just hope that people can know or be aware that there are many people out there that struggle on a daily basis might not be able to see it, but <laughs> it's there. Have a little compassion. Yeah. It was registered nurse and Nashville resident Jane Hefferon. After the break. I could see the diamond pattern of a snake. And at that point, it occurred to me that I'd just been bitten by a rattlesnake. So I jumped up and I said, What life feels like after an encounter like that and the science of snake bites. Plus, what animal should we try to keep away from here in New England? I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Be right back. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Today we're hearing stories from people who've survived injuries from wild animals. In 2017, Kyle Dickman and his wife Turin decided to take their two dogs and their baby Bridger on a month-long road trip that started at their home in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and ended in Yosemite National Park. They were met there by his brother Garrett and his wife Erin and his mom and dad. It was a warm day, and after a few miles of hiking, they came to a wildflower meadow to stop for lunch. Kyle picks it up from there. Where we stopped was the stone bridge over, over a creek that was just ripping down the mountainside. And uh, I remember getting up on top of this bridge and sort of catwalking across the railing and peering down into the waterfall. And my, my parents were over, you know, 20 feet away and having a snack. And Turin was, was nursing Bridger. And then I took a step off the bridge and stepped onto this rock. And I felt what it was almost like you, when you step on a stick out on a hike or something and you, and you get whapped, you know, and it didn't really hurt. But it was enough for me to look down and I was like, oh, that's, that's strange. So I looked down and I could see the diamond pattern of a snake. And at that point, it occurred to me that I'd just been bitten by a rattlesnake. So I jumped up and I said, <laughs> and my mom, who had been a, she had been an emergency room nurse for many years and then a physician's assistant for many years. And then both of my mom and my dad had been in search and rescue for going on you know, a decade. And they had done hundreds and hundreds of missions all over the place. And so they had a lot of experience in the outdoors. And so they finally said, well, what happened? And I said, I got bit by a rattlesnake. I got bit by a rattlesnake. And, you know, I think at first everybody was like, you didn't get bit by a rattlesnake. Now, you didn't hear any rattling, right? There was no rattling. I mean, the, and also we have all these like preconceptions about rattlesnakes being a bad thing to get bit by a rattlesnake. And in fact, it is a bad thing to get bit by a rattlesnake. But I didn't have any idea why exactly it was bad. I didn't know what it did. I just knew that it probably wasn't going to work out that well. And I guess, you know, in the back of my head, I had some sort of inkling that it's possible to die from it. But then again, it's possible to die from just about anything. So needless to say, I wasn't exactly thrilled. So my mom caught me and told me to settle down because if I continued to move in the way that I was moving, I would spread the venom quicker. I started to vomit very hard and then um, lost consciousness shortly thereafter and then continued to vomit. And vomit he did. Because their location was so difficult for rescuers to get to, Kyle vomited and pooped himself on and off until he was helicoptered out of the park three hours after the snake bite. Over the following 72 hours, at the medical center of Modesto, Kyle received 18 vials of antivenom. His leg turned black and yellow and swelled to twice its normal circumference. He was released after eight days, and thankfully he did get to keep his leg. It's been two years since he was bitten by that northern Pacific rattlesnake, so I asked him how he feels now when he ventures into the great outdoors. I mean, I do things that I'm that I feel are well within my capabilities. But I also think that like what awoke me to is that like, we don't get a control. I mean, look at this pandemic, right? Like we are exposed to risk everywhere at any moment and any point in the day. But what this is, is it's just like an, an additional layer of risk. Like I don't understand why people refuse to wear masks. Basically. <laughs> wear a f- mask, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. I am curious about Bridger was only six weeks when this all happened and this is your first time being a father and so that was new to you i wonder i mean people are already really protective of their kids full stop 
Has it made you maybe more of a protective father? Well, now we have two kids. So we have Bridger is three and ta- and we have a daughter now, Tally, who's two. I don't know that I'm more protective of them because of this. I don't know. Maybe I am. I really don't know. I'm pretty watchful of them. But I mean, again, like I think we let them do things that I think most people would be like, that seems like a bad idea. And like, they might be right. You know, maybe it is a bad <laughs> I guess we'll see if Bridger ever wants to go, you know, check out some wildflowers. Oh, for sure. I mean, we live in the National Forest. Like we live outside. We're outside every day. And I am really worried about snakes, of course. But I, I also understand that like there, there are risks in this world that we just can't control. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't venture out into the world. It just means we need to be aware of them and cautious and where reasonable. Now you went back to the place where it happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why'd you do that? I wanted to find the snake. (laughs) (laughs) What would you have done with the snake? Uh, I would have looked at it. I think, I I mean, I don't know what I would have done with it, but I wanted to see it. Um, I don't even know really why I wanted to see it, but I just kind of wanted to go and see. I wanted to just go and see what happened there and see the place and, if it was how I remembered it, and, you know, maybe to sort of like put the whole thing behind me. I'm not sure you really get to do that, but I went and did a bunch of research on snakes. And I think that like sometimes fear makes you lean in. And I think sort of understanding what happened to me required for some reason for me was, was to lean in and understand like down to a molecular level, what was going on in my body. And I don't know, I don't think there's any way, there's not necessarily any way out of these like, sort of mental struggles that you're going to have to go through. But that was the way that I did it. And I don't know if it worked, but uh, it was fascinating. I learned a lot of interesting things about rattlesnakes and venom. Yeah, you'd also visited Southern California's Loma Linda University. Are you familiar? One of the countries. No, but I read about it when I was researching you. Uh, But it's one of the leading treatment centers for snake bite victims. And you met Bill Hayes, a biology professor who studied rattlesnakes for decades. Was that trip part of that effort to understand the mechanics behind what happened and the truth and the things you can say, this is what happens and this is what happens? Is that why you did it? And will you tell the story about the um, the fake hand? Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell me about that visit. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, so I just like started researching snake bites and I wanted to know how bad mine was. And I went to Loma Linda, Linda University to meet with a professor there named Bill Hayes who just loves snakes and loves rattlesnakes. He had done a bunch of research on how uh, snake venom, on on how it affects people, on how we can sort of prevent the severity of a rattlesnake bite. And I just kind of wanted to go and meet him, I guess, and and hang out with him. And I didn't really know exactly what I was getting into, but he had prepared a demonstration where he wanted to show me um, how he determined how much venom snakes inject into predators. And so... (laughs) He had this room full of all sorts of different venomous snakes. And at one point, his snake helper, this guy's name was Jared. And Jared had gotten bit by uh, the same snake that they were bringing out um, during the same test a few years earlier and had spent more days in the hospital than I had. But for some reason, they, he, he wanted to show me how this whole thing works. So they bring out this rattling snake and they set it on the linoleum floor and he hands me a, like a snake hook, which is sort of like a, it's like a grabber that you use to pick up trash. And on the end of the snake hook is this latex glove that they filled with water or saline or something. And so my job in this case was to take this hook and shove it in the rattlesnake's face and get the rattlesnake to bite that saline glove. Now, how are you feeling at this point? Because this sounds harrowing. Like, it may not be helpful. How are you feeling? I was just felt very nervous about the whole thing, but there was also three guys who had spent their lives around snakes standing there next to me. And it's not like they're not, well, I won't say they're not aggressive, but they're, but they're, it's not as if they're going to like run at you. The snake only goes one way, which is backwards. And so they go backwards, 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 backwards until there's nowhere else to go. And then they go forward to bite you. Right. And so I took the, I took the snake hook and I stuck it in the snake's face and the snake wouldn't bite it. Like this was also really interesting to me. The snake coiled and coiled and coiled and rattled and rattled and rattled. I stuck it in the snake's face, this glove in the snake's face and the snake just sort of rattled at it and rattled at it and rattled at it. And I had to keep poking it. And these guys, these snake experts are around me are like saying, come on, poke it. You have to poke it. You have to poke it. And so I <laughs> poked the snake with it and then it would, it bit the glove and then it, that was it. The snake kept rattling and 
water dripped out of the glove and the snake handler picked the snake up and cooed to it softly and put it back in its cage. And I like soaked up the sweat that was pouring from my armpits and like had a cup of coffee and that was it. Like it was a strange thing to do, but it was kind of fun. (laughs) You've had to tell the story a bunch of times for a lot of different reasons and other radio shows and you're on TV and articles. I wonder to what degree do you feel defined by this experience? I mean, only to the degree that like people, frankly, like you ask me to talk about it. Like I don't, I don't really feel defined by it. You don't wake up in the morning and go, well, good morning, Kyle. Another day after the snake bite. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. That's a good question. Like do cancer survivors feel defined by their cancer or did they do only feel defined by their cancer when, when people define them by their cancer? Your job is to go out and look for good stories and this is a good story. And so like from that perspective, like I'm a writer and I make my profession telling stories. And so like, professionally that there is that aspect of it where I am defined by where I can talk about many things that I've written about, but people want me to talk about the thing that's personal and closest to my heart and like that evokes emotion. And so like, and these are all good reasons, you know, that's what makes this story compelling, but I don't personally feel defined by it. Like I feel defined by the fact that I have two lovely kids and an amazing wife. And like every day I go on living just as I normally would, you know, Um, having not died by a rattlesnake bite. And so I feel lucky, but I do think other people define me by it. You're the sum of your parts and this is just one part, but people definitely latch onto it. It's the most interesting thing I've ever done is to not die by a rattlesnake. (laughs) Well done. Uh, uh, Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. If when you went back to the spot where it happened and you did come across a rattlesnake, and you imagined that that was the rattlesnake, what would you say to it? Man, that really hurt. I, I don't know what I, I think, what would I say to it? Um, he was just doing it. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was a he, but it, it was just doing its job. You know, I would say no harm, no foul, but there was quite a, quite a bit of harm. But I mean, he like it, I mean, I just got unlucky. It bit me because I stepped on it or stepped very near it. So I don't know what I would tell. So what would I say to it? I would say, don't bite anybody else, please. <laughs> tell your friends. <laughs> Stay out of schoolyards. <laughs> wear a mask. Wear a mask. There you go. Wear, wear a mask. I like that. <laughs> That was Kyle Dickman. He's a contributing editor at Outside Magazine and the author of On the Burning Edge, A Fateful Fire and the Men Who Fought It. Now, we may not have tigers, and it's extremely unlikely you'll see a brown recluse spider here in Connecticut, but we do have some animals that we really want to keep a safe distance from. So I spoke with Tracy Rittenhouse. She's an associate professor and director of Wildlife and Fisheries Conservation Center at UConn's Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. I asked her to tell me what animals around these parts she thinks are the biggest threat. The species that comes to my mind is black bear. If you startle a black bear, they will protect themselves and and they can injure a human pretty easily if they so wanted to. Where would I be most likely to encounter these bears? Black bears have been seen in every single town in the state. It's just far more likely to see a black bear in the western half of the state than in the eastern half. In case I see one of these bears, what sort of things should I be keeping in mind? Well, I think in general, you don't want to startle a a black bear. So if you are hiking and you're talking to somebody, you know, that's enough noise that it guarantees a bear is going to notice you're there. Most of the time, the bear is going to notice you're there regardless of what you're doing. If you encounter a bear, you just want to hold your ground, never run, and slowly back away. Now, under what circumstance would they approach me? If a bear starts associating people with food. Right. So bears are omnivores and occasionally bears get accustomed to eating garbage. You never want to feed a bear. Right. You never want a bear to associate people with food. If I'm out in the woods, should I consider having like mace or pepper spray or even a firearm? Well, I definitely don't hike with a firearm. Um, 
you can carry bear spray, particularly if you're carrying food in your backpack that might, you know, if you're carrying peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in your backpack, then that peanut butter and jelly sandwich might smell good to a black bear. And so um, carrying bear spray is, is a safe thing to do. It works very much like mace works. The d- main difference with bear spray is that it, the cloud is broader. So you don't have to aim particularly well. You just, you just spray it in the general direction and it makes a bigger cloud. All right, so bears are definitely something we should be keeping an eye out for. How about snakes in Connecticut? Do we have snakes we should be worried about? Um, we do have two species of venomous snakes in Connecticut. They're both very rare, and you're very not, you, it's very unlikely to come across either one of those two species of venomous snakes. And both of those species are very docile species that you could walk right by and never know it. And that's the timber rattlesnake in the northern copperhead? Yes, when I worked in Missouri for a couple of years and spent a lot of time hiking in the forest there, I would see those two species several times a year. And I've lived in Connecticut now for nine, almost 10 years, and I've never seen either one of those species in my time hiking here in, in Connecticut. They're both pretty rare species. I think the only other animals to think about, we do occasionally find animals here in Connecticut that get rabies. And so if you see an animal acting odd, Um, or displaying any symptoms of rabies, you definitely want to not approach that animal and seek assistance. What's an example of that? Like, well, the first thing that comes to mind is like a raccoon and it's daytime and it's walking kind of floppy and it's foaming at the mouth. Is that about right? Or are there other things we should look for? Oh, good. My stereotype is correct. That's it. I mean, uh, raccoons are the most likely animal in this uh, part of the country to be rabid. Occasionally bats are found um, in this region of the country with rabies. Again, that would be if you saw a bat during the day or flopping on the ground, that's not normal bat behavior. Animals that are displaying symptoms of rabies, they they look sick in some way. And so if I see something that looks like it has rabies, what do I do? What do I not do? (laughs) Do not approach them, right? You don't wanna be bit. uh, The best thing to do would be to call your local animal control or Deep Wildlife has a dispatch phone number that you can call um, and they will send somebody out to get the animal. Now, some of the smallest animals that I think maybe people don't think about encountering and being dangerous are ticks. (laughs) Talk about ticks in this beautiful state. We are in the heart of tick land here. Again, I think the, the most important thing with ticks is that you find them on you within 24 hours. At my house, we do tick checks every night, year round. It's part of our bedtime routine to look ourselves over for ticks. Is there a place on the body that they they like to be in the most? I've been bitten by two ticks that I know of, and both of them were on my legs. But I've also heard of them staying in much more confined spaces on the body. It can be anywhere. They're often on vegetation at knee to waist height. And they're waiting for you to come by. And as you brush against the vegetation, they climb on to you. And and then it's just about where is the closest access to skin. And If you do find a tick, should you isolate it and put it in something and bring it somewhere? Or is that a little bit overkill, so to speak? You can do that. I I think uh, the Ag Experiment Station does collect ticks and they do test for and survey ticks. What I do is I put them on a piece of tape And I date that piece of tape and I stick them on my refrigerator. And that way, if someone were to get sick and some unknown reason, we have this ticked and we would have it, we could send it in for testing and and narrow down the range of diseases and pathogens that you can get from a tick. So I admire your commitment to the scientific method. I, on the other hand, when I have found a tick, I like to burn it with fire and flush it down a toilet so it has a terrible, undignified ending. So (laughs) lots of different ways to deal with ticks is what you're saying. Yes. That was Tracy Rittenhouse who joined us from vacation. Thank you, Tracy. She is the Associate Professor and Director of the Wildlife and Fisheries Conservation Center at UConn's Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. Audacious is produced by me and Katie Talarski at Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford. You can find more information and subscribe to our show at ctpublic.org slash audacious. You can send me your thoughts and show ideas on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Kyone Wolf. And if being attacked by wild animals has been a part of your life, I really want to hear your thoughts. My email is cwolf at ctpublic.org. And online, use the hashtag audaciouspublic. Thanks for listening and wear a mask.